So one piece of good news uh, was that food got mentioned at, at, um, at COP27. For the first time, food is sort of in the text. And why is that important? Well, it's very important in that food loss and waste is a very, very big source of um, emissions. Um, and it's also very important because the resilience and the adaptation that we all need will re require us to have food systems that will grow the crops that we need from a nutrition point of view in a way that they can grow when the weather is changing. So where you've got, where you've got flood cycles or you've got drought cycles, then you need to short crop, resilient, um, hopefully with sort of added um, minerals and vitamins so enhanced crops in, in, in very difficult circumstances. So food is a very, very big part of both adaptation and mitigation, and that's going to be on the agenda. Welcome to Great Decisions. Uh, we have an incredibly important uh, topic this evening, climate change, and we're lucky to have an amazing guest, Dean Rachel Kite, to help us try to make some sense of it. Um, so to set the stage, this November, more than 35,000 people, heads of state, climate diplomats, industry experts, business leaders, nonprofits, representatives of indigenous groups, environmental advocates, and last but not least, tonight's speaker, Dean Kite, uh, were all gathered in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, for the 2022 United Nations Climate Change Conference, um, otherwise known as COP27. For those of you that don't know, that's for the Conference of the Parties, and the 27 represents the 27th year that our world leaders have been attempting to solve this most pressing issue of our time. Um, this was a little bit unique. To many, this year was seen not just as a COP in Africa, uh, but Africa's COP, uh, a chance to direct the agenda towards issues prioritized by the global South and developing nations. And I'm sure many of you read uh, one of the major outcomes of this year's COP, certainly what got the most press, was the provision for a loss and damage fund in which wealthy, developing, developed countries that have historically and that currently produce the majority of the world's emissions committed to providing funds for vulnerable countries affected by climate change. Um, this move was met with celebration by some and criticism by others who argue that the fund is not real uh, and the progress is not there until the money materializes. So where do we go from here? What are the most pressing issues related to climate change right now? And how can we move forward as a community, a country, and a planet? So we're joined by Rachel Kite, who will help us tackle these questions and more. Um, first, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm Joe Haynes, a member of the World Boston Board of Directors. I've been asked to pinch hit on behalf of Mary this evening, uh, and it's my pleasure to fill in and welcome you to tonight's Great Decisions program. Rachel is the 14th Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She is the first woman to lead the United States' oldest graduate-only school of international affairs, which attracts students from all corners of the world and at all stages of their careers. Prior to joining Fletcher, Dean Kite served as Special Representative of the UN Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of the Sustainability, Sustainable Energy for All. She was previously the World Bank Group Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change, leading the run-up to the Paris Agreement. Dean Kite is also a member of the UN General's High-Level Advisory Group on Climate Action and was an advisor to the UK Presidency on the UN Climate Talks. She has received numerous awards for leadership in climate and sustainable development and was named by Time Magazine as one of the 15 women that were leading climate action. Thank you for joining us tonight. And if you'll allow me just one more moment before I turn the microphone over, I'd like to take a moment to just help us all kind of envision what, what goes on at COP and what the importance is. Um, I did not make it to Egypt for this year's festivities, but I have uh, had the privilege to attend a few in the years past under an observer badge. And it seems whenever I return home, uh, I'm invariably asked or told by, by friends and colleagues that they heard nothing got accomplished this year, or that the event was all talk, or some such doom, gloom, disappointment. And of course, and admittedly, we have a long, long, long way to go in order to hammer out the policies and to 
fund the initiatives that will help avert the existential climate crisis we face. No one is remotely satisfied with the progress so far. But I think it's important for everyone that has not seen it firsthand to try to conceptualize what is being attempted at the previous and all the future COPs. Um, maybe it will help first imagine a multilateral trade agreement, take the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm going to overly simplify this, but the TPP began with about a dozen countries with generally aligned interests, and yet still a decade went by without an agreement because these things are difficult. Now think about the climate negotiations at COP. We're trying to achieve consensus amongst every country on Earth. Uh, it's safe to say it's by far the most multilateral, multinational negotiation in the history of humanity. Um, and every country brings a different perspective and different priorities to the table. And in doing so, they do it with the full responsibility and understanding that every citizen of their specific country and every citizen on Earth will be subjected to whatever we, whether we succeed or fail at this. And so, while the results to date have been far from perfect, I just want to say that it's through the Herculean efforts of folks like Rachel Kite that progress has been made at all. Um, to paraphrase, ter paraphrase Teddy Roosevelt, it's not the critic who counts, the credit belongs to the person in the arena. So, Dean Kite, Thank you for being our person in the arena, and thank you for being here tonight. The floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I think I spoke to Will Boston before um, when we were all locked down um, from my living room. Um, so it's nice to be here in person. I'm going to speak in British English with a few American inflections for the crowd in the front. <laughs> so I went to high school in Boston in England. So it's always kind of interesting that how many people in Boston, Massachusetts don't know very much about Boston, England. I think they, they go back as far as Plymouth and then they don't know what happened before that. So maybe we can educate them over. Um, over drinks. Um, so I, I'm delighted to be here um, uh, to talk about something very close to my heart. But I, I think it goes to the very heart of, um, of great decisions. It goes to the very heart of, of what uh, uh, well Boston is about. In one of the adages of foreign policy or the way in which countries uh, re relate to each other is that the best form of foreign policy is to manage your own country well. If you can manage your own country well, you can invite anybody over to see what you're doing and you can exert both hard and soft power in so doing. And it's very interesting to think about this basic premise of how countries relate to each other, but not just countries, but cities and states and civil society. It's very important to think about this in an age of, of a climate crisis. So we have to work together because as the Secretary General, both Ban Ki-moon and now Antonio Guterres will always remind us there is no planet B. Uh, we have to work together, but working together and building trust to manage our economy into a very different shaped economy, one that is in balance with the chemistry of the planet, one which does not leave people behind, that to do that, while man managing ourselves together to do that, will require us all to actually do our own things very well as well, but in a different way. And I think that one of the things that we saw at COP27 was the um, reaction of large parts of the world to the global north. We could even frame it perhaps as the West, not having done what it needed to do at home very well over the last 20, 30 years when it comes to climate change. So there is an inevitable policy response from other countries when you ask them to do some things that you're not prepared to do yourself. There is an, there's an automatic reaction to being told what to do. I mean, whether you're a five-year-old, whether you're a five-year-old and your parent wants you to go to bed, or whether you're, you know, or whether you're a teenager, or whether you are a country, the, the relationship has to be one built on trust and integrity and a sense of, of we're all in this together. And I think that you could argue that over the last few years, for many countries, especially in the developing world or in the global south, and here we were at COP27 on African soil, 
they could make a plausible claim that we haven't really been there and been showing up. We haven't shown up on climate change in that we have not, as the largest and polluting countries and the countries with the longest historical record of pollution, done enough to curb pollution, carbon pollution, over, over the recent past. We haven't fulfilled our promises in terms of support for countries to be able to adapt to climate change. And we haven't fulfilled our promises on the finance and the technology transfer that should flow to help countries both manage their own growth in a low emissions scenario and to be able to adapt to climate change. And critically, and Sharm El Sheikh, we could also be accused of not really um, coming forward with suggestions on how we are going to fund loss and damage, and I'll come to that in, in, a, in a moment. And so walking into the summit, okay, at a difficult time, this has been a complicated year, China and the US no longer talking as we entered into the climate talks, and not even talking about climate change, which had been the one area where conversation was, was still going on. A complicated world because we'd had an, an energy supply shock following on from Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which had spiralled uh, the fuel inflation impact around the world had caused huge food uh, security dislocation, in, in particular including in, in Egypt. Um, and of course it had been a year of extraordinary climate impacts as well. So not an easy scenario in which to fashion, as Joe was saying, the kind of collaboration and cooperation that is necessary. But a COP represents, again as Joe said, you know, one country, one vote, everybody in the room, everybody trying to work this out. Difficult to do if you're a country of 100,000 or 200,000 people. Marshall Islands, Vanuatu, some of the countries that lead the charge from those most impacted. Complicated enough to do if you're a large industrialized country with many ministries and many experts. Trying to pull all of this together is difficult to do. Climate is everything and everything is climate, as Time magazine said last year. So what I'm going to try to do is talk a little bit about what happened, where we are right now, and what to look for in 2023, and then open it up for, 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 for a conversation. I think it's also interesting that there are multiple strategies at play, because climate change is everything to everybody now. This has gone far beyond the re domain of intergovernmental relations and in the intergovernmental space. So at COP, yes, countries are negotiating with countries, but on their delegations and all around them are civil society, is business either in a transparent way or an untransparent way, um, and then cities and regions and everybody else who has something at stake in this. And what we're seeing is the sort of fraying at the edges or certainly tensions emerging in how we organize ourselves so that we're all in the negotiation, but that you can have a negotiation where things get agreed between the parties that must agree them. And some of that tension is also because different parts of that puzzle have taken deliberate strategies. So, for example, Vanuatu it has gone to the International Court of Justice, supported by 20 to 30 other countries and others signing on at any given day, asking for a judicial ruling on the fact that climate change is something that has been caused by some and is impacting others. So putting the questions of justice and equity between uh, those who've polluted and those who have been impacted, intergenerational equity at the very heart of the international justice system. Well, of course, for those countries that have been historic polluters, the United States, the United Kingdom, European Union and others, well, that doesn't feel very friendly, right? So here you are trying to negotiate something co co cooperatively and somebody's saying, well, actually, we're looking for a judicial review. And then, of course, there are others who are looking to sue. You have uh, active, uh, 1,600 active lawsuits around the world filed by children, filed by civil society organizations against governments, against companies for the fact that when they knew 
what the, uh, what the impact of climate change would be. They did nothing. So it's the what did you do when you knew maxim, which of course we understand in this country from tobacco and of course from oxycotton uh, and, um, and opioids. So uh, it's a all strategies to the table sort of strategy. And I would argue that it, it kind of works because it pushes things along. And if, you know, if it's an emergency, I don't honestly think that you could ask people to just sort of, well, just, you know, friends and family first, you know, let's have the, dip, let's have the diplomats meet in their traditional settings and see what they can resolve. Because what we've seen in recent years is that in the negotiations, in the language, they find it difficult to even agree that fossil fuels are part of the cause of the problem. And so we have these arcane conversations in Glasgow last year about whether we should phase down or phase out coal. And in Sharm el Sheikh this year, proposed by India, very interestingly, that the language not be just coal but be fossil fuels, understandably from India, because India has a coal issue in its transition, it's coal dependent, huge social and economic ramifications of moving away from coal, wants to have time to be able to manage that, doesn't want to have to work to some kind of metronome set by some other international body, but very keen to uh, accelerate the energy transition, which India is fully bought into, and so suggested language that we should be phasing out fossil fuels. More than 80 countries supported that, but that didn't even enter into the text. Why? Well, we can suppose why, but the, presidents, the presidency, the Egyptians, didn't feel that that was something that they wanted to put in the text, nor that they feel that they could take the 80 countries in support of it and massage that process. And I think that the only, the only states who I think were on the record as being opposed to it were Saudi Arabia and a few other Petra states. So we see all of this. So of course, that reported home, that witnessed by civil society and by business and by other countries, that's not progress enough. And so you see these other strategies emerging. So in COP27, mitigation. So this mitigation, you know, is the is the strategies around um, stopping, uh, phasing down, phasing out the pollution that we're putting into the atmosphere that is causing the problem. So going in, we need to be at 1.5 degrees, right? This is the scientific consensus, is that we really need to limit warming to one and a half degrees. Um, that is, equates to, in, in sort of lingua franca, being at net zero in the mid-century. Um, we can have a whole discussion about what net zero means. But we're not, at one, we're not on a pathway to 1.5 at the moment. And going into COP, I mean, generously, if you believe what everybody has said that they're going to do, and if you believe that they're actually in, in, in a good shape to do it, then we're on track for about two and a half degrees, between two and a half and three. If you're really optimistic, then maybe if you add up everybody's pledges and you really think they can do everything that they've pledged to do, then we're maybe we're at 1.8. So, are we much better off after COP? Well, no, not really. No, not really, because you see that implementation is in a bit of a hiatus, in large part because of the recessions, the inflation-induced um, fuel price spikes going on in the world. And you see, it, it, as Europe, um, as Europe um, pivots away from Russian hydrocarbons, it is opening up gas fields and coal-fired uh, power plants in order to cope with a cold winter that's probably going to sort of bring emissions up for a short period of time. Europe is still on track for the 55%, now 57% reductions by the end of the decade. So there's a bit of a blip, and hopefully it's a blip and not a sort of permanent state of being. But it makes, um, it, makes it difficult to have sort of say that there was huge progress on mitigation. And many countries have taken both COVID and the pandemic and the economic downturn uh, and their problems with inflation, the debt distress that many countries find themselves in as a result of all of this economic dislocation, as an opportunity to sort of like put off to tomorrow what they could have done today. And of course, and we'll come to this, the financing available for many countries to manage their transition is not fully available. So on mitigation, we didn't really make much progress and we had this ridiculous conversation. I mean, not ridiculous in diplomatic terms, but in objective terms about what really causes uh, the problem and whether or not we're able to agree as a community that we can say it. 
this was an Africa COP, and so going into COP27, the focus was on adaptation. How do we help countries adapt to the climate impacts which they're already experiencing now and that they will experience in the, in the coming years because of the pollution that we've put in the atmosphere over the last 30 to 35 years? It's diff adaptation is more difficult perhaps sometimes to get your hands around and to, to have a clear goal. So the 1.5 is something that is a rallying point. Net zero is a rallying point for mitigation. For adaptation, it's kind of everything. It's, are our hospitals designed to work for the kinds of health impacts we're going to in, 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 um, experience as a population? And are our health systems set up to work in the kinds of weather extremes that we're going to um, uh, experience? So do we have the backup energy supply when we're going to have brownouts and blackouts in extreme heat events and then are we equipped to cope with a community that is going to experience extreme heat events so it's health it's education it is the natural environment it is uh, the coastal environment are we able to adapt and so this is basically development in in all of its aspects and yet this should be paid for over and above the cost of uh, of development so we know, we know less about how to do this, and we don't have clear goals around adaptation. But we have got a proxy, which is over the last couple of years, we've sort of said that all, if all the financing going into climate change, 50% of it should really be for adaptation. Big international organizations like the World Bank are being encouraged to make those kinds of goals. And you saw people sort of coming up to the table and saying, yes, okay. But you didn't really see the kind of galvanizing of the international world around adaptation, even though we were on Africa's soil. But where I think things did, get, get, did become galvanized was around loss and damage. So loss and damage is the concept of uh, compensation uh, for, the, for the losses and damages incurred as a result of climate change by those economies and societies that had did nothing to cause the problem. So it is, it is a compensation mechanism for those countries that caused the problem to those countries that didn't, or those societies that caused the problem. Even though you know, much, of the, much of it may have been incurred at a time when those societies didn't know that they were incurring the problem, nevertheless, the concept is agreed, has been agreed for a number of years. But for those countries that would be on the hook for this, uh, which would be the countries uh, that were 20 years ago recognized as the countries that have polluted the most. So that would be Europe, the United States, Japan, Australia. So the, what we call um, uh, uh, a list of countries, A countries, that these countries um, so have agreed to do this, but for the longest time, this, is, this poses huge political problems at home. It, in the United States, there is an allergy to a concept of liability that this could be used to, uh, by others to uh, project onto the United States that it is admitting liability and that therefore it's on the hook. In, you know, this is a litigious society that this would mean that the United States would be opening itself up to kind of international evaluation from that perspective. And I think also in a country that is not comfortable with the concept of reparations in any form, uh, reparations from, uh, related to slavery and, and colonialism, uh, and obviously in the UK similarly, there is some um, uh, reluctance, I think, to, to, to deal with this question because perhaps this is an admission that there is some kind of reparation necessary um, as, as a result of, of, of how we ran our economies uh, up to now. So with the president of the, the Egyptian president saying, look, we're not talking about liability and we're not talking about compensation, we're just talking about facilitation and cooperation, there was a conversation around loss and damage. And what happened is that the chair of the developing country group in, in, um, in, in, in the way that the UN organizes groups, so that countries are organized into groups for the purposes of negotiation. So the chair of the developing country sort of group, which is called G77, it's way more than 77, we won't get into that, was Pakistan. Their climate minister, Sherry Raymond, extraordinarily articulate, fierce, 
and was taking no prisoners in a country that has lost you know, well over 10% of its GDP because of the extraordinary floods that we saw just a few months ago. She was able to channel sort of the moral indignation um, and the frustration of many, many countries into a demand for an agreement that there should be a loss and damage fund created separate from all of the other transfer mechanisms of finance from the rich to uh, the global south. Going into the negotiations, the United States was very clear that it was not ready to agree this. Neither was the European Union, neither was Switzerland and, and, and other uh, developed countries. But by the end of two weeks, there was an agreement on the fund. Now, there was no agreement on who pays into the fund. There was no agreement on who will host the fund, on how the fund will work, or who could, take, who could benefit from the fund. And there was a lot of language around you know, the countries that are now emitting, but 20 years ago weren't at any scale, so China, India, etc., should they pay in? I mean, should they benefit from the fund? Well, no. So how are we going to do this? So for the next two years, you are going to see a lot of discussion around all of that in order for that fund to operate. But notwithstanding all of that, the fact that the fund was agreed was important. And it was an important, I think, measure of a slight tilt away from the global north to the global south. Because it was very difficult for the EU or the US or anybody else to sort of say no. We look every day on our televisions and see the climate impacts that are coming from what science has said is our own economic behavior over the last 20 years. We have not done enough to curb emissions in our own economies. It was difficult to sort of come up with a morally supported view for why you wouldn't create a fund or why you wouldn't come up with a better idea. And I think there, again, uh, the EU and the US could have come with ideas. It was very clear that this was going to be a big issue, but the opening negotiating position is, no, no, we're not ready to negotiate that. No, we're not ready to agree that. We'll need another year to talk about possible ways in which money could flow. The developing world was having none of it. And I think a few years ago, if the developing world was having none of it, then they would have had none of it. But this, this was different. And why was it different? Well, because we didn't show up with vaccines when we had COVID. We haven't shown up with the climate finance we've promised. We haven't shown up with ways in which to make the cost of capital in emerging markets cheaper. We haven't turned up with the trillions of dollars necessary for them to invest in green energy. But we did turn up when we wanted their gas quickly because we're having a cold winter in the north. And I think all of these things have come together to change the relationship. So what should we look for in 2023? Well, I'm going to talk about finance because I think this was actually something very, very important that happened. Up until now, there has been a tendency to talk about an additional sort of flow of financing necessary for climate change. A hundred billion that was promised uh, in Paris in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was agreed. It had been promised earlier than that as well, but kind of got repeated. And the idea was that by 2020, a hundred billion dollars of additional finance should flow from rich countries to poorer countries to support climate action. Well, of course, it was a political number. It was kind of plucked out of the air, depending on who you believe. It was originally put down by Gordon Brown and then picked up by Hillary Clinton and then repeated. But it, it, it bears no relationship to the actual needs of, of countries. But it was a promise, and it was a promise that has been failed to be kept year on, year on. And here we are in 2022, and that 100 billion still doesn't flow. We're, we're sort of in about 90 billion, I think, at the moment. Um, and so it's become, it's become a sort of pea in the mattresses, right? The princes in the pea. It's become an irritant. But what you saw at COP27 was, yes, that's an irritant, but let's talk about the financial system. And the reason why we had the financial system conversation is, again, because a number of developing countries have just sort of said, look, we need the financial system to change. It is implausible with the level of impact that we're experiencing around the world that if a cyclone hits us full on, we then have to come and ask for aid and humanitarian assistance. You must help us be resilient to that cyclone before it hits. The most articulate person and the most I think forceful on this has been Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, who has pushed 
for over a year. She made a blistering speech in Glasgow and has continued that all the way through the year, asking for a financial system that is more just. Now, her requests for financing and a different financial structure around climate are also meshed with a anti-colonial, post-colonial view of the international financial institutes, institutions, which were created 78 years ago when most African countries didn't exist as free nations. I think there were four African countries that were independent when the Bretton Woods institutions were created. And so she said, look, you know, for the 21st century, for a world of, of uh, 196 nations, we need a different financial system. So what has she been calling for? Well, she has been calling for uh, the special drawing rights that were issued in 2021 as a response to the shutdown under COVID and the economic downturn at that point, that the, that money, as it is allocated to countries, should be reallocated back to the IMF and to others to use for climate finance. She's asked for debt and climate swaps. She has asked that the, the, the designation of which countries can access finance on the most favourable terms be changed. Not now anymore just by a measure of income, so the, the poorest countries from the perspective of, of, of national income, but by vulnerability. And so she has said, and her team have said, that look, um, the countries that are losing uh, more than 5% of GDP in every given, any given year because of climate effects, they should be able to be con considered vulnerable and therefore able to access finance at scale. Now, that's interesting because that means that a number of countries that are experiencing or are likely to experience that kind of loss are not just poor countries. So Barbados, her own country, is a middle-income country, but it is highly vulnerable to climate change. And so she's making these kinds of, uh, these kinds of points. So um, she has said that there is about a trillion dollars that could be released from the international financial system by asking development banks to take more risk, to change the way the IMF understands who's vulnerable, to create new instruments. And also, she has pointed to an oil spill reserve mechanism, which was created after, the, uh, after one of the great uh, oil spills. And it's you know, every country that is um, uh, over a certain amount of revenue from oil puts a little bit of money into this oil spill reserve account at the International Maritime Organization, and it's used to help countries recover from an oil spill if it were ever to happen. And she's like, look, this is like this is the mother of oil oil spills, sort of from an analogy point of view. So why can't we take um, those who are making a lot of money? out of this particular crisis of climate and have that put into a fund somewhere to be used. So, for example, that would speak to windfall, pro windfall profits by oil and gas companies and energy companies, something that the Secretary General has called for. So what you saw in COP was a conversation about how do we change the financial system to work for a world where everything is being changed by uh, climate change. And Joe said in his introduction that, you know, sometimes you wonder, well, why did 35,000 people go to the desert in, in, in Egypt? Does anything ever happen? Some things actually happen very fast. This week, we're celebrating five years of something called NGFS, right? So what is NGFS? So it's a network of... Uh, central banks, banking supervisors and regulators, all working on how to green and make resilient the financial system. Five years ago, I think three banks, the Banque de France, the Netherlands, the Bank of England, first met and it gave birth to this thing. Now there are more than 83 central banks and including the Federal Reserve in this country that joined uh, just after uh, President Biden was elected. And they're having profound conversations about how do we understand sovereign risk? How do we understand all of the issues of macro prudential risk and, uh, and how to manage our economies when we, we see the dangers from climate change? That's all happened in five years and is beginning to feed into the way that different countries think about this. 
Now, we're going to face a world where the US will do it one way, the Europeans will do it another, China will do it another, and it'll be difficult from a global perspective to make sure that these tectonic plates move closely together. But we are where we are. And so let's go back to how I started. If we're going to work together as countries to cope with this crisis, then we have to be trusted between, there has to be trust between us. There has to be a sense that we are true partners. And what I think we saw at COP27 was the developing world saying, we're not sure we can trust you. We need you, but we're not sure we can trust you. I don't think they were saying that they wanted to trust China either. I don't think they were running into the arms of Russia. But what I think they were asking us to do is as we conduct ourselves in our international affairs, that the first thing that we must do is take care of how we manage our own economy and our own society. And if we do that, then we can be a partner that can be trusted. Thank you very much. So I appreciate the clarion call, Dean Kite, that you gave. If we want to do well in the world, manage our own policies, um, think globally, think locally, nationally for answers to go globally. So what say you to the people of the United States from Flint, Michigan, and from the indigenous countries and territories of the Dakotas and Dade County, Miami, where I grew up, where people who I know have all been yet gone, gentrification. If we, to have the leadership and the support of the United States, we need the support of the people. How can we get there? Because that's the only place we can come from. Yeah, so, great question. Um, I, um, I'll give you, so I'll come at this from an international perspective and then come, come, come to you. Um, in the summer of this year, I was in, um, in London with a, a, a number of African business leaders and African heads of state in a sort of fairly small meeting. Um, and this was before the Inflation Reduction Act was, so this was like June when it looked like Joe Manchin was saying no and there was no deal and, you know, and I think what most Americans don't realize is that the rest of the world is holding its breath every time there's an election, every time there's a midterm, every time there's a piece of climate legislation that is or is not or one person gets to uh, make a decision. Um, the rest of the world's holding its breath just like the people of the United States are holding their breath, especially those that are um, historically disenfranchised or haven't had their voices heard. And, there, I, and I think that there is a, um, you know what it's like when you, you have no control over the situation. It wears you down. It is debilitating to be, you know, a little boat on an ocean and you, you can't uh, control it. And I think that uh, there is something that needs to happen in the foreign policy of this country to have a little bit more recognition of that. Um, but this one African business, and th this, I won't mention his name, but, you know, he is world renowned and like he is, he is extremely connected and very savvy and very, very successful. And he said to me, like, OK, so we get that politics in, in Washington is difficult. And we know that one party doesn't and one party does. And even that party that does has its issues and da, 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 da. But where are the American people? Do the American people not understand? And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, I think that we tend to hide behind. We, I mean, I, uh, I'm, I you know, I live here. My kids are Americans or were born here. Um, we kind of hide behind how difficult Washington is, right? It, it kind of like makes it, it's easy, well, it's Washington, right? We, we, we have to do something. And so then that brings us to the local level. So then where is the conversation at the local level about how we're gonna steward our resources? Where is the, you know, have we got the places within our own societies and our own communities and our own faith communities 
around the decisions about how we manage water, how we manage food, how we manage to make sure that we're all eating healthily but that there's enough food for all. How are we having the conversations about whether or not we are investing in um, anaerobic digesters in our, you know, composting in our local towns. I mean, there are little things that if we all do them, will make a profound difference. And then, of course, our civic education, you know, are enough of us voting? Are enough of us voting in an informed way? Are our kids being educated that at 18 they get this gift, this extraordinary gift of being able to use it? So, no. So for me, climate is about what does it mean to be a citizen? And for those who feel on the outside of citizenship, how does climate help bring them in? So I, I, for me, when, when, the time, when Time magazine said climate is everything and everything is climate, they weren't, I, they weren't exaggerating. And you know, if we think about a world where we, we have to negotiate in Montreal right now while I'm speaking to you whether or not we can find a way to protect 30% of the planet and leave it alone so that we just live on 70%, which for most indigenous nations is not enough. But do we understand that we don't get to use everything? Um, if we're going to have that kind of profound discussion in a negotiating room, we need to be having that profound negotiation with each other. So a non-answer, but work to do. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I, I love the insights on the civic education and engagement being such a big part of this. Um, next, we're going to go to the gentleman in the red vest. Hi, thanks for your time. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the role that powerful polluting interests like fossil fuel companies have on the negotiations and what, in your view, should their role be? Yeah, so great question. So, in, in, so for, for everybody in the room, so in Glasgow last year, the British government sort of sent out, you know, very discreet signals, but not so discreet, sort of saying, look, you know, you know, if you're a gas company, we're not going to be having, you're not going to be able to sponsor the conference, and you know, you, there's no, there's no sort of VIP track for you. Um, and so basically, uh, most of the big oil and gas majors didn't turn up. I mean, they just stayed away. They, they got the message. Um, you know, Greta and her friends were in full force, and um, there was a feeling that this was not um, this was not going to be important, and it, this wasn't going to work. And, and just if, in adv about two weeks before uh, Glasgow, the TED. Do uh, you know what the TED talks are? So TED did a TED countdown. Um, uh, in Edinburgh, so uh, just, uh, well, for everybody other than CNN, most people know that's a city about 40 miles away, but CNN kind of got it wrong during Glasgow, but, um, sorry, inside a joke there, but uh, Wolf Blitzer had set up, a, you know, one of those canopies outside Edinburgh Castle and kept talking as if he was in Glasgow. He's like, no, no, no. Um, but uh, the serious point was that um, they invited, it, there, were, there were all the TED Talks that were recorded and then there were debates and they invited the CEO of Shell into a discussion moderated by Cristiana Figueres, who was kind of climate royalty. She was the UNFCCC, sec she was the UN Secretary for Climate at the time of the Paris Agreement. And so she was moderating a conversation between the leader of sort of the Scottish uh, Friday's movement, so the young people and the, the, the CEO of Shell, and basically everybody walked out. And I think it was a very important moment because I think Ted f feels or felt that they are pretty clued in to where the mood is. And, and it, went, it, was not, it was not good, and there had to be all kinds of sort of conversations uh, to really understand what had just happened. So I think most CEOs from oil and gas companies stayed away from Glasgow. Fast forward a year to Sharm El Sheikh, there were about 670 oil and gas executives of one kind or another at Sharm, and that's the FT, um, reported that number. Most of the oil and gas executives that I saw there and met there were, were wearing other people's badges. So they, they hadn't, you know, they, they hadn't sort of enlisted. Well, of course, business can't, can't go to a UN conference. You have to go as an industry association or something. But they were there as industry associations, which were not automatically identifiable 
as an oil and gas company and, and I think some oil and gas companies actually went with country badges on. Um, I think the, the one that's been reported is Bernard Looney, who's the CEO of BP, went with the Mauritanian badge because he was signing a deal in Mauritania um, or with the Mauritanian government. Now, in and of itself, that's not necessarily, it depends what they're doing while they're there, right? So I think the issue is not that the oil and gas companies shouldn't be there, but oil and gas companies, if they're there, have got to be pushing for the changes that we need. Um, and so this goes to the issue of the, the pledges that companies make. So if you're making a net zero pledge, first of all, you have to show that you're scientifically on a pathway to getting to net zero. You have to explain how you are going to do it. And then you'll have to also say that you're not going to use your government affairs budget to lobby against the transition. And, and so this kind of, how do we understand what integrity means when you're making a pledge? This got discussed very much uh, in the margins of, of Sharm el Sheikh and is a major concern for the Secretary General. So the companies can be there. It depends what they're lobbying for. And then I think you've, you know, most 80% of the oil and gas in this world is actually explored and exploited by national oil companies, not by the listed majors. So then the question is, you know, where is Petronas, Petrobras, um, you know, Sinook, uh, all of these uh, companies? Um, and of course, the one, I think the country that probably had the greatest influence on the outcome was Saudi Arabia. Now, next year's climate talks go to the UAE. So the UAE has made a very ambitious net zero pledge by 2050. They're going to have to explain where they are with that process because I don't think anybody thinks that there's enough detail yet to know whether they have a plan to get there. And of course, they, they are a country rich on natural resources. And I think most recently they did a deal with Malaysia to make sure that Malaysia comes in and helps it with oil recovery and tar sands and, 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 these, and some fracking in offshore waters. So um, I think the question for UAE is not should the oil and gas industry not be part of the COP28? They should be, but it's, the question is how are they part of the solution? Um, and you know, maybe if you've got the kind of economy like UAE hosting, maybe that's the place to have that conversation in a way that we couldn't have it in Egypt and in a way that we couldn't have it in Glasgow. But, um, so I don't think that they shouldn't be there. I think it's, it's what are they doing when they're there and with what commitment do they come to the talks? Great. Um, who's, go ahead. I would just say quickly uh, on CNN posting up in the wrong city, I think they might have had more, Wolf and the gang had more confidence in the fancy restaurants in Edinburgh than they did in Glasgow. And having been in Glasgow all week, they might have been onto something. Oh, no, there's more Michelin stars in Glasgow than there is in Edinburgh. I, no, you know, no, I, mean, I didn't have the reservations that you, you had. There you go. There you go. Hi. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. My question is. How do you see the growing reality of climate refugees changing the conversations that you've just spoke about as questions move from adaptation and mitigation to possible and current relocations that are happening? So that's a really great question. So I think that there's a lot of, <clears throat> so there's been, I think up until now, a lot of reticence to sort of, it's an allocation conversation, right? An attribution conversation, you know. You know, these people are moving, can we attribute that to climate change? Uh, increasingly, I think the evidence is that yes, we can, if, if indirectly, if not directly. Um, and uh, the scholarship and the, the, the research and the tracking and the engagement with these communities will, will I think, reinforce that. So uh, it was, it's interesting to then have a COP in Africa because you know, most migrants go one country over or go to a different part of the country. I mean, they, they, you know, we're transfixed by the images of people coming over the southern border of the United States or people in boats coming over the, um, the English Channel or coming across the Mediterranean to Lampedusa and then up through Italy. Uh, m the vast majority of migrants are not doing that. They're migrating into cities in countries that are ill-prepared to host them and who are extremely vulnerable to climate change themselves. So Kampala, Tripoli, uh, et cetera, or, or Guatemala City or, 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 or the cities across Central America. 
So the question is, how does a city that is already highly ir irresilient to climate change absorb the kinds of climate, uh, climate refugee populations that we're, we're talking about? And I think that um, th you know, there's no easy answer to this. Uh, this is going to be a critical issue. And we have very poor sort of, uh, I think, evidence around the, the costs of this. So, you know, most cities don't, um, you know, don't have really strong finances, um, don't have access to streams of financing. We were just talking in the green room that internationally finance goes country to country, and then it, it's supposed to flow from country down to municipal or down to city level. Um, and that's true for humanitarian assistance as well as development assistance, etc. So I think we've got a whole financial problem. And then we've, it's a domestic issue as well. So if you think about Houston, Houston is a sh huge sponge city. It's been absorbing climate refugees, frankly, for, since, since Katrina and then every, every storm since. We know that people are on the move out of parts of Colorado and out of parts of California because of recurrent fires, etc. So we're living this here, but we don't have a very good sense of what the line item cost of that is, nor are we thinking about that in the future. Now, FEMA has, I think, appointed a senior you know, person within FEMA to think about these things, uh, but this, that's a first. And so I think that, and this goes, I'll reverse the question back into loss and damage here. I'll link the two things together. If the, I mean, I'll posit it as a notion and we can go away, discuss, and let's see if it makes any difference and throw it back at me, you think it's silly. But if, the, if more people here understood how much loss and damage we were already incurring here, poorer communities, indigenous communities, uh, the communities of color, you know, in, in, in extremely vulnerable places. That number is not captured at the moment. What you will do is get a number in a newspaper article, I predict next week or the week after, in the Post or the Times that says, the cost of extreme weather events in the United States this year has topped more than 200 billion or something like that. And that number will come from an insurance company. But it won't, it won't actually, uh, count any of these costs of communities that have moved, of families have moved, that income has been lost in one city and gained in another, or the uh, additional costs of, of caring for that family or that community uh, on your social security budget or whatever, in, you know, uh, in any other way at the municipal level. So we don't have a picture on the fact that we've got loss and damage going on right now, and a lot of that is, is beginning to include internally displaced people or internal migrants. I think if we knew how much we were incurring, maybe we would think about the fact that others in other countries are incurring this problem slightly differently. And, and of course, the costs that we're going to incur domestically are going to far, far, far exceed you know, the, the amounts of funding that, that some other countries are asking for. So I think it's an emerging issue. It's certainly something that we're doing much more research on. Uh, at Fletcher, for example, you know, the work that we've been doing on human security and migration for many years now, together with climate analysis. Um, so I think it's one of the big issues that doesn't get anything like the attention that it should do at the climate talks. Great. And we're going to go to our friends on Zoom. I think Natalie has a question. And then we're probably going to run out of time after that, I would think. I'll keep my answers short. All right, thank you. I'm asking a question from our Zoom registration from Hassan Usmani. Um, they're wondering specifically how the U.S. plans to help poor countries deal with the impacts of climate change uh, when those countries have contributed very little to the creation of the actual problem. Yeah, so I think this is a <clears throat> so I think this is a, a, a big question. It's a big question of the United States. Um, I think the the administration doesn't believe that it can go to Congress for any um, um, financial allocation or for a appropriation for loss and damage for a fund or for anything else. I think that part of John Kerry's diplomacy has been trying to do things that don't involve going to Congress to get anything else appropriated. And the rest of the world knows that. The rest of the world is kind of brassed off about it, but kind of understands that's reality. Um, but then um, is concerned that maybe the kinds of funding that John Kerry can 
sort of believe that he can it, sort of generate is going to be loans, it's going to be private sector investment and things like that, whereas I think there's a feeling that there's the kinds of funding that are going to be needed uh, are going to be the kinds of funds that have to be on the most concessional terms or actually have to be grants. And, and so there's this lots of tension. So what does the US have to do? I think what the US has to do is engage in this process about the reform of the Bretton Woods institutions and the multilateral development banks because that's where there are hundreds of billions of dollars sort of sitting ready, you know, that should be deployed, could be deployed differently, could be deployed to take more risk. And that therefore there could be sort of trillions of dollars that come out of that system. Now the US is the largest shareholder of the of the World Bank and is a significant shareholder in the regional development banks. And you've seen the US really working with the Inter-American Development Bank recently to sort of force them um, and to encourage them into a different mode mode of operating. So I think that you know that's where the US can see that there is money already tied up in a system that needs to be released given that it can't go to Congress or it doesn't believe that Congress would be um, favourable to any request to meet this. So I think the rest of the world looks on, is kind of dismayed, but understands, you know, the reality, doesn't like the reality. Great, thank you. And um, as part of my deal, I got to ask one question. So I would like to end on maybe something, an encouraging note. When we were backstage, we talked about recent um, positive trends around people getting behind the methane reduction pledge, uh, green hydrogen. What are other trends that you're seeing, whether it's breakthrough technologies or financial mechanisms, market mechanisms, or even the potential for coalitions of countries or a diplomatic breakthrough to take place? If you look forward, say, five years. So one piece of good news uh, was that food got mentioned at um, uh, COP27. For the first time, food is sort of in the text. And why is that important? Well, it's very important in that food loss and waste is a very, very big source of um, emissions. Um, and it's also very important because the resilience and the adaptation that we all need will re require us to have food systems that will grow the crops that we need from a nutrition point of view in a way that they can grow when the weather is changing. So where you've got, where you've got flood cycles or you've got drought cycles, then you need to short crop, resilient, um, hopefully with sort of added um, minerals and vitamins, so enhanced crops in, in, in very difficult circumstances. So food is a very, very big part of both adaptation and mitigation, and that's going to be on the agenda. The second thing is I think that the healthcare community and the climate community are kind of understanding the health issues. So we need health systems that are fit for purpose for climate, and we need a climate a clim climate strategy and policy that understands the health implications. In this country, the cost to the healthcare system of climate impacts is already higher than our annual defence budget. And um, we have a pretty big defence budget. So, you know, I think that that's, people are just beginning to realise that this is, this is about, um, this is about how the healthcare system works and the kinds of healthcare issues we're gonna have as climate. So I think these are really positive because these have been on the margins of climate, but now they're coming. Now, new technologies, I get very excited. You know, there are firms that can, you know, um, that have got, a, I think for any of you who are watching the Earthshot Prize, you know, we can make single-use plastic out of seaweed. Well, there's a lot of seaweed in Maine, Massachusetts, right? We got a lot of wind off the coast of Massachusetts. We can have green hydrogen here in Massachusetts. We can do all kinds of things. There are companies recycling minerals out in Woburn. I can't say it properly because in England we say Woburn. Um, there are companies that can spray packaging around the shape of the, of the gizmo that you're shipping. So you're not going to be, you know, what Amazon is doing at the moment, which is shipping a lot of air around the country on a constant basis. That's not efficient. There are technologies. We know about vertical farming. You know, we eat lots of leafy greens. Um, uh, I don't, I'm not sure it works for everything, but I think it, it, it works very well. So the technology is just leaping forward in every aspect of our life to be more energy efficient, to work off an entirely renewable energy grid. So there's lots of reasons to be excited. The public policy in this country is beginning, is going to start kicking in. The kind of investment we'll see flowing into this country as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, is going to be extraordinary. The US now has to work with its trading allies 
and partners so that this isn't punitive to them and the, the, the rising tide rises all boats. But when we put our mind to it and we get behind some of these technologies that will work to give people access to the technology, that will reduce emissions, that will make us more um, resilient, there's a lot to be hopeful about. But we need, as a number of people have said, our politics to be as good as our science. Great. Well, thank you. That concludes the speaking portion, but I invite everybody to come upstairs with us and see all the local environmental groups and, and please network. And thank you so much to, to Dean Kite for all your insights and Natalie and the World Boston staff for putting this whole event on. We'll see you up there. Thank you.